This is a topic near and dear to my heart. I don't talk about topics unless they are near and dear to my heart. I do really so much enjoy <clears throat> studying and sharing Cleveland's history, particularly those aspects that aren't popularly known. And I just really, really wish people would know more about them. Uh, like John said, he's driven down the boulevard and not really known what it is that he's looking at necessarily, especially for those who might be new to town. You come here and you'll wonder what this is. And I think there's a lot of different ways to look at the cultural gardens. Historically, to understand why was this land used for cultural gardens and city park land. And I think that's the key to understand first, because it was um, many years ago when there was actually a cultural garden federation. And there was a man named Charles Wolfram, who was president of the gardens for 25 years. Uh, he was a man of deep spiritual purpose. He was devoted to any cause that would aid human brotherhood. And what a wonderful quality that is in anybody. The way he lived his life was in a way totally dedicated to service and the betterment of others. So he wanted to establish these gardens, but where to put them? How can we get the land? Well, truly, the name of the boulevard was named Liberty for a very long time. And the reason being that they were dedicated after, just after the ending of World War I. They were dedicated to the 845 young men from Cleveland who died fighting World War I. And those people who fought, those men who fought in the war were recognized along Liberty Boulevard, which was a path of red oak trees. And once upon a time, there were small plaques, just about maybe four by six, uh, brass plaques on wood that were placed at the bottom of each red oak tree all along the boulevard to remember each one of those over 800 young men. Now the boulevard at one time expanded all the way down to Shaker Lakes, which is the origin of Doan Creek. And then Doan Creek, of course, flows north and dumps into Lake Erie. Well, <clears throat> it was thanks to the generous gift of three early benefactors for our city that we had this land in order to turn into the cultural gardens. And the gifts were from Jeff the Wade, for one, whom you see here on the left, and then the next being John D. Rockefeller, and the last is William Gordon. These three men held title to the land that spanned what we know today to be Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Now I'm well aware of its name currently and correctly. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King was an amazing man, wonderful in his oratory, in his thought, in everything he did. There's no man who really represents world peace better than Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So it is appropriate that the boulevard should be named after him at this time. However, when I refer to it as liberty, it's purely out of the sense of history because it was named Liberty for so very, very many decades um, due to the fact that it was dedicated to the soldiers of our first war. And at that time, they believed there would never be another war like that one again. Well, when we had this land dedicated to us, we had the land that was um, at the extreme Southern end donated to us by Jeff the Wade. Now, Jeff the Wade was a very intelligent young man who had um, worked at a telegraph company in Detroit before he came to Cleveland. And to make a really long story short, he had bought and sold a bunch of smaller telegraph companies and formed them into one larger one, which was uh, Western Union. So hence, you know where his millions had come from. Um, John D. Rockefeller, of course, in the oil business here in Cleveland, 
And um, William Gordon was actually in the grocery business. He had wholesale grocery out of downtown Cleveland, um, down on West 9th, which was once called Water Street. And uh, he was also the mayor of Glenville. And he raised uh, racehorses on his property on the North End. You see in the picture postcard there, that's the beach of Gordon Park. It was important to William Gordon that the land be used for public relaxation. He, as Jeff DeWade and John D. Rockefeller, all believed that we Clevelanders needed a place to get away from all the uh, social hubbub and craziness and soot and what have you of the big city. And together they wanted to donate land in order for us to go there and enjoy as a public park. It was hundreds of acres from each of them. Um, when William Gordon died in 1892, he had spent a fortune developing the northern end of the boulevard there for us to enjoy. There were bathing beaches on the water and um, there was a provision in his will actually where he said that no bridge or a wall or building may be built on that property to block our view of the lake. And that stayed true all these years because that was an important provision to him. He wanted to make certain that we could always go there free of charge to enjoy the lake. Um, Jeff DeWade at the extreme southern end, his land comprised the area now where we know today's Cleveland Botanical Garden to be. Uh, the Art Museum, the Lagoon, that's actually named Wade Lagoon down there, and a lot of the land that is currently part of Case Western Reserve University. Uh, Jep the Wade, for all William Gordon was all about relaxing, Jep the Wade was all about having fun. <laughs> he actually had our city's very first zoo on his property. In fact, if you go to Cleveland Botanical Gardens, you'll notice the Hershey Garden is cut out in a way that isn't natural, and it isn't. He cut it out that way. He made there to be, you know, dips and valleys and, oh, such interesting land there where different animals were kept for our first zoo. Oh, it was nothing too crazy. No lions and tigers, but he had deer and alligator. That was kind of exciting, <laughs> and other animals like that. It was um, later... <clears throat> in uh, 1896, when Jeff DeWade closed the zoo there on his property and they bought land over at Brookside Park off of West 25th Street, where our city zoo has been ever since. But Jeff DeWade also had the lagoon where you could have a rowboat and there were swans in the lagoon. Um, there was even a merry-go-round on his property just to provide fun for everyone. But it was the largest gift of 275 acres in the center that was from John D. Rockefeller that tied those two ends together, Jeff the Wade's and William Gordon's land. In 1915, the string of parks along Doan Creek were actually the largest source of fresh water for Clevelanders. And the natural springs that kept the Doan Creek moving were so fresh and clean that people would come out from the city with buckets to fill in order to get the nice clean water. So much so the Cleveland police actually had to patrol Doan Creek to control the crowds because so many people came out just for the water. When you go down the roadway here of Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, also known as Liberty, you'll notice these beautiful um, bridges that span the roadway. These bridges were actually on John D. Rockefeller's property. And John D. Rockefeller commissioned the bridges to be built by a man named Charles Schweinfurth. Now, Charles Schweinfurth des designed our Trinity Cathedral a university school, many other beautiful buildings, not only around Cleveland, but also our whole country. He was a very well-renowned landscape architect. 
He also did the building at the southern end of this roadway. I don't mean to say building, the bridge. And it's interesting to note that although these bridges are over 100 years old, they have had very little maintenance done to them over the years. They stood very strong and were designed so well that they haven't need much care at all. When John D. Re John D. Rockefeller gave the land to the city, of course, the bridges came with it as a part of the beautiful park-like setting to enjoy. Now, there's several ways you can look at the gardens. You could look at them chronologically, which one was first, which one is most recent. But I think, you know, maybe more logically to understand them would be to take a look at them geographically. We're going to kind of pretend like we're walking through them. Now, if we were to all get together, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> Up on a bus and go on down there, we probably will pretend that the bus is going to take us from the north end where I-90 is all the way to the south end. And you'll know there's a parking lot down there by the tennis courts, by the uh, Veterans Hospital near the Doan Creek area. And if you parked in that parking lot, which would be a good place to park in one of the closer ones nearby, you'd actually have to walk a little over a mile to the north to get to the very first of the cultural gardens. Oh, it's a beautiful park-like setting to enjoy. But for the very first of the cultural gardens, you'd have to walk that far. Now, each one of these gardens, I must say, are uh, cared for by volunteers who are proud of their ethnic heritage. Not to say that if you aren't of an ethnic heritage or that you couldn't help volunteer, they'd love to have. Many hands make light work. But everything that you see in the gardens is really thanks to the dedicated volunteers who make it happen. Now, when you go to the very most southern in the string, that would be at this time, now mind you, they're ever changing, but at this time it would be the Irish Garden. Now, back in the 1930s, when most of these, most of these were laid out, um, it was kind of charming to note that they had a lot of details to them reminiscent of their country of origin. This one to the south is Ireland. And this one is an island, just like Ireland is. <laughs> it has a span between what was once called Upper East Boulevard and Lower East Boulevard. The Lower was then renamed Liberty and now renamed Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. But between these two roads, it is a little sliver of land that stands by itself as an island. Uh, once they even said that the Irish garden was said to be the greenest of all the gardens. <laughs> leave it to the Irish. I can say that with a name like McFarland, but leave it to the Irish to say, oh, that one is the greenest of all the, of all the gardens. But the one thing that you won't see from the road, as you see the road is just beyond the garden there where the fence is, you won't see the fact that it's laid out in the shape of a Celtic cross. And as a Celtic cross might be, the green of the cross there might be gold perhaps, and the circle around it would be colorful gemstones perhaps. And in this case, they plant it with colorful flowers. Um, beautiful to look at. Um, the garden, because it was planted with plants, not just that would look nice or would grow well here, but they brought plants from the original countries. And I think that's awesome. So for the Irish garden, they brought uh, juniper, yew, white lilac, hawthorn, lavender, wisteria, shamrocks, cowslips, and the Shannon roses for the borders. Many of these original plants are still here today so many decades later, like, oh, 80, 90 years later, there was a, a cinder pathway that was planted with Irish blackthorn, which is the wood that was used to make a shillelagh. The garden was dedicated in 1933 
on the 150th anniversary of the birth of the poet Thomas More. In 1960, at the north end of the garden, the Irish League dedicated a bust of the poet Victor Herbert, or composer, I mean to say, I'm sorry. Here it is, you're standing at the north end looking towards the south end of the garden. Literally, if you walked all over just even one of the gardens, you could spend an entire afternoon to note all the very many dedications of walkways, of shrubbery, of the symbolic gestures, such as the Celtic cross and things of that nature. Decades later, May 11th, 1952 on Mother's Day, there was a tribute in this garden to Ernest C. Ball. He was the composer of many Irish ballads, one of which was Mother McCree. And so Mrs. Charles Ingram, who lived in Lakeside, Ohio at the time came, she was the daughter of the composer of Mother McCree. Uh, she was born and raised in Cleveland, but on that day, that Mother's Day, she planted a mountain laurel shrub in his memory. Our prosecutor, Frank Culleton at the time, recognized Mr. Ball, who is responsible for the recognition of Mother's Day more than any other American in the United States, so he said. <laughs> there was also in September on a Sunday, commemorations for Commodore John Barry, who was born in Ireland and supported the cause of American independence. Uh, he became known as the father of the American Navy. Officers of the United States Navy have been principal speakers at Berry Day over the years. So like at Emerald Isle all to its own, the cultural gardens uh, chain of gems, this one was planted specifically to represent eternal hope, typical of the courageous people from Ireland who planted it. Now, mind you, as I said, we're moving from the south to the north, and each one of these gardens has such a unique history to them. You know, the size, I don't know why were the sizes the way they are. I don't know if that is understood or if they just would say, you know, they want one acre, two acres, three acres to plant their gardens. Over time, almost every decade, represents different celebrations in each one of the gardens. So they're forever changing, which is a more special aspect of them too. You see the stone carved in their language, October 29th of 1939, came a few years after the original dedication in 1933. A fountain was added most recently in the gardens just two summers ago, and it's beautiful. There are, I think to date, nine fountains that are in the cultural gardens and each one working very well. Some of them had been placed there in the 1910s and to say they've lasted this long is pretty special. The next one in the chain is the American Cultural Garden. This one is really kind of interesting to me and I think especially symbolic because in here they brought soil, just good old dirt from 40 countries of the world, mixed it up, put it down as the foundation of the American Cultural Garden. <laughs> Isn't that kind of neat and symbolic? I mean, wow, we are such a patchwork quilt of ethnic diversity, especially here in Cleveland, that that seemed a very appropriate gesture. The entrance to it, there once was a bronze bust of Abraham Lincoln on this stone pier, as you see. Unfortunately, there were decades of time when there was trouble down in the cultural gardens and there was a lot of damage done. Some of the metal, the bronze was stolen uh, to be sold for money. And um, I'm happy to say a lot of the damage that had been done has been repaired, replaced. Uh, the bust of Abraham Lincoln still isn't there yet, but that's all right. Um, maybe it will come back one day. Maybe we'll make a new one. 
A statue for Booker T. Washington is made with a new composite material of a stone resin combination, which is not something anything would anybody would steal because it's not worth anything as a stone in and of itself. But um, as I say, for each one of these gardens, you could honestly almost spend a whole afternoon just looking at all that. Um, the American Colonial Garden also in 1933 got the promise from the Cleveland Parent Teachers Association where they voted unanimously to support that garden for the rest of its years. Again, more amazing volunteers to make this happen. In the next garden that came along to the north, it is the Hebrew Garden. Unfortunately, I'm sad to say that all of the original bronze plaques that were in this Hebrew garden had been removed or vandalized. But thankfully, the plaques have all been reestablished now in stone. Uh, the garden was dedicated in 1926, and it is one of only two that predated the 1930s. This one was actually the second garden to be put in here. It is oriental in design, curiously, and it has three main sections in a circular forest tree setting. Uh, the philosopher's circle in the center where you see the fountain spraying water there, it is surrounded with seven symbolic pillars of wisdom. Uh, inscribed with a passage from Solomon's book of Proverbs. An olive tree is planted there, which is most characteristic of Hebrew history, and it is featured predominantly in the philosopher's circle. Uh, there is a music section planted in the shape of a Hebrew harp or lyre, um, dedicated with a plaque bearing portrait faces of three Jewish composers. Um, one of the more recognizable uh, features of the rock garden is a circular plaque having a bron bronze bas relief of Rebecca Gratz, founder of the first Jewish religious school in America. She's the famous prototype of Rebecca, the her heroine in uh, Scott's Ivanhoe. At the dedication, it was emphasized that in 1928, when this was dedicated, there were two works of literature that they felt were most significant. And that was the Hebrew Bible for modern culture and the works of Shakespeare. <laughs> Curious, they said, there's two things worth reading, Shakespeare or the Bible. <laughs> and it was noted that the Hebrew garden side also faces the Shakespearean garden in a very purposeful way. In 1949, a plaque was dedicated to Emma Lazarus to honor the 100th anniversary of the poet's birth. On her plaque were written the words of her most famous poem, which the words are also inscribed on the Statue of Liberty. Um, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. These words reflect the spirit of the cultural gardens. In the tablet of bronze, the entrance, it says, bountifulness is as a garden of abundance and benevolence in forever. The Hebrew garden, with all its setting of I'm getting feedback. I don't know if you all are. So the Hebrew garden with the fountain in the middle, which is a pink marble fountain, as I say, inscribed with the Book of Solomon, is truly a beauty to behold. The cement work, the stonework has been there since 1928 and has changed very little over all those years. Here's a close-up of that beautiful pink marble fountain with the pillars of wisdom in it. The gardens can be really sincerely enjoyed any season of the year, be it spring, summer, fall, and yes, even winter. I have gone there when the snow is deep and I still find it very peaceful and charming 
to walk through the gardens. Next to the Hebrew garden is this area, which had not been really described with signage until recently, but this is part of the Shakespearean garden. Originally in 1916, this was dedicated as the um, Shakespearean garden, but then later, a few years later, they changed it over to the name the British Garden to reflect more of all of the other gardens that represented a country of the world and not just one poet, although he was so very widely uh, recognized. The, there are areas of the Shakespearean Garden, oh, I'm even calling it that, the British Garden, <laughs> that um, show some damage. And yet I am glad that they never just removed it. And I'm ever hopeful that they might repair it and bring it back to its original glory. It's interesting to know that this was once a sundial. It would have had a bronze dial on the top of these stone legs here. It was given to us by a man named Robert Mantell. He was kind of like the Robert Redford of England. England in 1918. He was a popular Shakespearean actor, such a popular actor that everybody knew his name in his day. He was so taken by the fact that here in America, we had a whole boulevard dedicated to world peace, representing all of the uh, countries of the world. And he wanted to give a gift as many of the gifts in the gardens are, it was dedicated just to world peace and given to us to enjoy. So I do hope that um, we will be able to repair this one day. Meanwhile, it stands strong as it is. There is a bed of roses also in the Shakespearean garden that was uh, one of Shakespeare's favorite flowers, but it was given to us by the mayor of Verona in Italy, and you wonder, why was the mayor in Italy giving England <laughs> roses? Well, it was because it was said to be roses from the area of Juliet's tomb. Many significant plants and flowers and trees are in that garden. One even dedicated to the coronation of Queen Elizabeth in 1951. Now the Hungarian garden is next along the path to the north. This garden is very recognizable today because of its beautiful ornamental ironwork as well as the stone. It was sculpted actually on two levels along East Boulevard, Upper East Boulevard and Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. It was designed by a landscape architect from Budapest and it's very distinguished in its looks because the two areas are supposed to be more formal for the lower garden and more casual for this, the upper garden. This is what they say a country casual look would be. To my eyes, that looks very beautiful and I'd be happy to have anything looking like that in my backyard. When you walk along, there are walkways to the side and you can understand why so many of these gardens actually comprise two or three acres of land, which again is how you can spend a whole afternoon in one of these gardens. You walk along and you'll see the tiniest detail. These benches have actually stone carvings of Hungarian flowers in the ends of the benches. And of course there are plaques and busts representing so many people important to the Hungarian heritage. Um, it took $4,000 to plan and create the gardens in 1934, but the efforts were well worthwhile because over 5,000 members of Hungarian organizations have taken care of this over the years. Every year they march along East Boulevard in a formal um, event for parades, or as they called them, visitation days, when people would come into the Hungarian garden. Um, they would have music, flag ceremonies, uh, speakers, pastries to share, everything to make it a beautiful time. 
when you're standing on the upper level of the Hungarian Garden looking down, and that is Liberty Boulevard in the distance there, that lower level was actually planted in a way to represent the more formal gardens of the country of Hungary. Now they've been redesigned quite a bit from how they were originally, but still very beautiful. And the volunteers have gone to great expense to make them look as pretty as they are. Next to these is the German garden. Now the German garden was third in historical order of the chain of gardens. The British garden was first, then the Hebrew garden, and then the German garden. And just as with its neighbor, the Hungarian garden, this German garden is also on two levels. The reason being that Upper East Boulevard pretty much stays flat where all the businesses and um, homes in East Cleveland and the colleges, but Lower East Boulevard or Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard follows Doan Creek. So it goes down at a lower altitude following the creek. And so that's why the need for two levels. But here in the German garden, you have this very impressive bronze statue of Goethe and Schiller, two of Germany's greatest poets and philosophers. They dominate the garden and they are the tallest in the string of the gardens. Um, when you enter the garden, you go through a triple arched ornamental gate of wrought iron. Um, <clears throat> two significant Germans, Gotthold Lessing, a critic and dramatist, and Heinrich Heine, a world famous poet and journalist, are remembered with bronze busts on pedestals as well. As well. To get an idea, I'm five foot nine, and when I stand in front of this statue, my head is just under the name Goethe on this statue. So you can imagine how very tall it is. It's a little difficult to see from when you're driving down MLK because all you see is the back side of them and they are up so high, it's hard to gauge um, the look. But it is an amazing statue. And I happen to know that this was another gift to the city but it was one that was given unanimously. However, one of my other studies, believe it or not, are the early brewers of Cleveland. <laughs> and one of those early brewers was um, Leonard Schlother, who owned a brewery on West 25th Street, where today we know it as the Great Lakes Brewery. That was Leonard Schlothers. He came here to America at the age of only 16 and built a successful brewery. He was so proud and grateful to his new hometown of Cleveland that he donated this statue to German cultural gardens. Um, more than a hundred varieties of shrubs, hedges, trees imported from Germany decorate this garden. The funds to develop the garden were acquired by a series of card parties, poetry readings, song recitals, and coffee and cake benefits. Uh, the original garden was dedicated in 1929 as a part of a week-long celebration honoring the Lessing Mendelssohn Bicentennial. Uh, the Lessing bust was dedicated at this time. A long list of enthusiastic supporters contributed to this garden, one of which was John Eisenman, one of the engineers responsible for the design of our old arcade downtown. What a beautiful structure that is. There are so many people of note in all of these gardens, about 39 to date, and more on the drawing board to be added. But it's curious to note that of all the people they recognize in the gardens, there were philosophers, poets, artists, scientists, you name it. But the one occupation that is recognized the most, teachers, teachers from every country of the world. And here you have Father Jan, the founder of physical education. <laughs> Everybody's favorite class in high school. <laughs> I loved it actually. <laughs> this here 
that is um, unmarked to date, but I hope that perhaps they will be able to mark it, is a very rare Unterberg marble fountain. And this fountain came in that area that looks kind of like a um, small chimney, perhaps. And water would have come out of a relief there with a spigot, and it would have filled that pond with water and then it would have spilled out through that opening and trickled down to join Dome Creek. This is the other side of what looks like a chimney. And this is the very rare Unterberg marble. Now this marble is over 300 years old, way predates any of these gardens. But it's awesome that they gave us this gift that was so old when it was dedicated that over the years, unfortunately, as you can see, this marble has not stood the test of time very well in our Cleveland weather. If you stare at that lower level that looks like a recess there, there's a circular form at the top of that recess that is a lion's face. Germans love their lion faces. It represents strength. <laughs> and the lion's face actually has a spigot that the water came out from the lion's mouth to fill the fountain at one time. And again, although this one doesn't work and it isn't quite looking as it was originally, I'm just so thrilled that it's still there because that is the oldest thing in the chain of gardens. The next one down the boulevard is the Lithuanian garden. Now this one too has two levels between the upper and lower boulevards. And there's just a, a beautiful view from both levels. This one, the Lithuanian garden is actually constructed in the shape of a harp because it's emblematic of the Lithuanians love for music. I was told by a Lithuanian that they use music to express every emotion if they're happy, if they're sad, if they're jubilant, if they're just sharing a quiet time, whatever, music is at the heart of all of their emotions. Um, for many years, National Prussian taught the Lithuanians to express all of their emotions through music. The stonework in this garden portrays three epics of Lithuanian um, history. There's a sculpted wall on the lower level that represents the unification of Lithuania's three provinces at the beginning of the 14th century. And then a reproduction of the three pillared piece of sculpture stands as a memorial to Lithuanians um, past greatness. And the large stone fountain at the top is the fountain of Biruta symbolizing yet another stage in Lithuanian's history. Here you can see the three various levels. Beautiful stonework in here. Oh, when you consider, I must stop and remind you all, these gardens were created during the Great Depression. The Great Depression. And literally, we all, for our ethnic heritage, who cared to be a part of this, would donate nickels and dimes and quarters and would have you know tea parties and what have you in order to raise money to make this happen so when i see these gardens and i think this is the strength of all of our ethnic um ancestors who pulled this together to represent world peace at a time when we had so very little i think it's just wonderful to know Here's another angle of that lower level plaza. One of the kind of unique features is traceable to the pagan influence of the very, very early years of Lithuanian culture. They used a zigzag motif as a part of their decorative theme. At first, I'm wondering, why aren't these gardens a little straighter in their edges? but it was done purposefully to represent the one God they revered over most, and that was the God of lightning. And the God of lightning and um, in honor of Perkunas, the ancient God of thunder, uh, once wor was worshiped in Lithuania. 
its rebirth pretty much happened after World War I, which as I said, these gardens were dedicated following World War I, where they thought they would never see another world war like that again. Um, several extra oak trees were planted in gratitude to the strength of the supporters of the Lithuanian Alliance and the Lithuanian Roman Catholic Church. Uh, this garden was dedicated October of 1936 um, with the unveiling of a statue of Dr. Basanavikas. And at that dedication, a representative of the United Nations spoke and said, it's encouraging to see a great municipality of Cleveland actually demonstrating that its citizens may speak different languages, may have distinct customs, may be partisan of various political or religious beliefs, and still be peacefully united in common purpose for a common and noble achievement. That's words worth recognizing, especially even yet today. Here's the upper level plaza that you can only see from Upper East Boulevard, not from Liberty Boulevard. Some of this you're able to see from the upper and some only from the lower. But when you walk around them, they are really a joy to be able to appreciate all of them. Here's a close up on that fountain. Uh, each one of the fountains, as I say, function very well. They are all turned off for the winter, but they are turned back on in the spring for all of us to enjoy. Now the Greek gardens are next as you go to the north and they are very imposing. Tall Doric columns on the upper boulevard represent an immediate impression of the Parthenon. This you cannot see from Martin Luther King Boulevard because that is behind and down of the uh, greenery that you see behind here. Uh, this one is a sunken garden and it follows the lines of a Greek cross. The simple classical effect is obtained without any flowers. In fact, terraces formed within this square cut sandstone are planted with ilex, myrtle, and sweet bay. There are cedars and poplars to give the spire-like impression of cypress. Uh, the feature of the Greek garden is the pylon symbolizing the wall of Parthenon that you see in the distance there. Here is a close-up of it. This is dedicated to the Greek spirit of philosophy, art, literature, and science. It's inscribed with the names of many Greeks who have influenced these arts over the ages. Gargoyles once stood here as well, but unfortunately have since been removed. But the open air life, which Greek climate invites more than Cleveland's climate, <laughs> it is reflected in the airy beauty of this garden. And it is in Greece where the individual, individuality of architecture first became clear. And Cleveland has had a reputation for nationally acclaimed architects with the early influence of Greek culture. The Greek garden was officially dedicated in 1940 in an elegant ceremony. Dr. Ellie George, president of the Greek Garden Association said that he wished our ancestors will always enjoy it and keep in our hearts the principle of cooperation that made the garden possible. So in August of 1949 on the 100th anniversary of the death of Lord Byron, another famous poet, an evergreen tree was planted in his memory. He and other leaders in the realm of literature and science made that small nation of Greece a very mighty influence in the shaping of civilization. They, like Byron, believed that it is the duty for lovers of democracy to support the cause. The strength of this mighty culture is very much seen in these gardens and they are just so charming to walk through. Now, a person doesn't have to be of Italian heritage to appreciate the Italian gardens. Oh, these are just so beautiful. And I don't know why it is that this one is one of the largest, at least to date. Oh, it had to have cost them so much money, again, during the Great Depression. 
But even so, it is amazing. Two levels of form, formal landscaping um, were conceived in this area. In the summertime now, you can hear the operatic voices shining through. Now this summer, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we weren't able to have the opera in the Italian garden, but hopefully one day it will come back again. There is on the um, upper level, a very large circular fountain, which we saw in a Brown's bust of the poet Virgil. This unfortunately is another one of those busts made of bronze that were stolen and is not back in its place yet, but I'm ever hopeful that he might come back again. The garden slopes gracefully to a lower walkway in a circular piazza court form with cut stone with a walkway. Here is Dante represented on one of the upper levels. You see the pilasters behind Dante there representing the um, upper level behind the fountain as you approach the fountain behind it are those pilasters right. and you think oh this garden is so large certainly it can't go much farther but it does and this is one garden i could be wrong but i think this is one of the most popular places for a wedding to take place in the summer last i heard it was only ten dollars for a permit to have your wedding in the garden. And I was there once where three wedding parties were lined up back to back, waiting for their turn to get married in this garden. When you're in the upper uh, level from Upper East Boulevard and you want to go down to the piazza, you do so down a circular staircase that takes you there. You'll see Liberty Boulevard right here in this picture <clears throat> in the distance. All that hand cut stone is amazing. Put down so many years ago, almost a hundred years ago, but still as plumb as the day that it was put down. Mind you, right up the road there, not far from here is Little Italy where a lot of Italian stonemasons were so kind as to donate the gifts of their talent to make this beautiful garden possible for us to enjoy today. I tell you, give me a coffee and a cannoli and I'll sit here and think I'm in Europe. <laughs> That's the great thing about these gardens. You don't have to really travel anywhere. You can just pretend you do. <laughs> I sit and I look at this wall and I think about all of the people for the arts and science. Uh, Verdi, uh, Marconi, Da Vinci, oh, the list goes on and on about the people who contributed culture to the world. Why are these gardens called the cultural gardens? Because of that, any format of culture that the various countries gave to the world, not just in and amongst their own people, but what they gave to the world is what's showcased here in these gardens for us all to enjoy. On that wall is a three-tiered fountain that, again, you just want to throw a penny in it and make a wish. It's truly just so spectacularly beautiful and really in almost any season of the year. When you're on the upper level of the Italian garden looking down, <clears throat> you see that car there is on Liberty Boulevard. Now here's a secret tip. If you don't want a whole lot of miles to walk, one secret tip is where that car is, if that car were to turn right, going north, turn right, that is how you enter Upper East Boulevard, right there next to the Italian Garden. And when you go on up to Upper East Boulevard, you are allowed to park on there. And it's very safe, very comfortable, lots of street parking up there. You're not supposed to park on Liberty Boulevard, but you can park on the Upper Boulevard. And that makes it much easier to walk to any one of the gardens that you hope to see. On the other side, north of the Italian Garden is the Slovak Garden. And um, these gardens were originally described as being very modern in spirit. 
They comprise three acres of land on the lower boulevard. Stone steps lead to a large forum where two bronze busts remain dedicated to their history. Reverend Jan Furtick and Reverend Stefan uh, Kolar. Now these two men were kind of a yin-yang representing Slovak culture because one was a man of science, another a man of the arts and humanities. Uh, one was Lutheran, one was Catholic, but they both were teachers. <laughs> Again, so many teachers recognized in the cultural gardens. And they did have one belief together, and that was that if you bring people together in unity to uh, enjoy literature, music, the arts, watch people dancing in their native costume, enjoy the pastries of the native people who create them, and just have a wonderful afternoon, um, as they call them, visitation afternoons. That's what the Slovak Garden was really, really dedicated for. Because the first thing you notice is that it's a three acre pasture. And really those two busts, as you see the one here, just to the left of center, were the only things that were in the garden for a very long time. And the purpose was not to distract people with fancy flowers and trees and all that or busts. Um, it was just to bring people together because when we can be together socially, that's when we all benefit. There was another um, statue dedicated later but uh, Reverend Kolar here, as you see on one side, and Reverend Furdak, both of them men of the cloth and teachers. Um, unfortunately, these bronze busts were stolen in recent years. But the happy news, before you worry too much, is that the busts were found very quickly because now the police department, when a theft is noted, word goes out to all the places who might take in scrap metal. And it's kind of hard to bit, bring in a big, heavy bust of Reverend Kolar and try and trade it in for scrap metal. They knew right away where this belonged and they have been returned. This is the pasture land where sometimes up to 20,000 people would gather for visitation days. And what a great time they would have here on this lawn enjoying poetry or music, dancing, and you name it. The next one to the north is called the Rusin Garden. Now, shame on me. I thought I paid attention in the geography class as a kid. <laughs> I thought maybe did they spell Russia wrong, but no, there are Rusin people here in Cleveland. Now, I know that um, someone said here, much of the information has been taken from the book, Their Paths Are Peace. Yes, Clara Letterer wrote that first book in 1954, and I'm happy to say it has been reprinted and still available. So yes, a lot of the information was from there that inspired me. However, I'm gonna tell you at the end too, couple other places where you can do even more in-depth research as well. But to get to the Rooston Garden, this is in a recessed wooden glade that slopes from the lower boulevard to the upper boulevard with a set of so stone stairs overlooking Doan Brook. The Rooston Garden plot was dedicated June 25th, 1939 with ceremonies being led by Cathedral Latin School Band. Um, we had many important people to Rusin heritage here. And um, just to explain to you, the Rusins are actually people who have a Slavic race of Asiatic origin from which stem Russians today and Ukrainians. But prior to World War I, the Rusin people comprised a part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They lived in the Carpathian Mountains and it was difficult to get to their country of origin. And you know what? It's difficult to get 
to this garden as well. They actually moved this statue, which I love that it says, I was, am, and always will be a Rusin. This actually was at the bottom towards the ravine. So it was very challenging to get to. You almost had to go through the Slovak garden to get to it. But that was representative of the way the country was as well. To find the Rusins in the Carpathian Mountains was very challenging um, as well. And these beautiful gardens, when you are on Upper Boulevard, you can look down into them. Beyond the shrubbery, you see the back walkway there. Beyond the shrubbery and a tree dead center, you can see Doan Brook is there and beyond that is Liberty Boulevard. So you really can't see the Rusin Garden from Liberty Boulevard until it is winter time but it's rather challenging to get to very simply, but so very well preserved and taken care of, even though the Rusin population is not that large in Cleveland. The way I understand it, when World War II happened, the Rusin country was totally absorbed by Russia and the Rusins fled to Hungary where they came to America often marrying Hungarian people and settled in the area around East 70 something here in Cleveland, which is also the Hungarian neighborhood. The Czech garden is next to the north. And this one is very beautiful. For reasons I can't say, none of it was damaged during the problems in the 1960s along the boulevard. All of the original statuary has been left alone. There's a monumental stone wall in the background there that you can see with a sculpted frieze portraying the discovery of Bohemia and the American migration of people here. There is this statue, I love it, how it says the Czech Cultural Garden, homeland of teachers, statesmen, martyrs, musicians, and so on. I love the teachers get top billing. <laughs> I don't know why that is amusing to me, but overall the others, um, teachers is first in every one of the gardens. They really revere teachers. In fact, another one of the Cleveland born sculpture, Frank Jerush was one of Czech descent who actually created all of the busts here. Um, there are trees, shrubs and monuments on this one acre uh, plot of land for the Czech gardens. Uh, rose bushes are very prominent here as well, having been brought over from Czechoslovakia. And um, again, the Czech people had card parties and they would do anything they could to raise the money to be able to create this garden. We must remember during the Great Depression, um, Busts that had been absent for so long are now being recreated for decades of time. Only the background of this statue here was present with the pedestal, but no bust was on top of it. And now they have replaced it. So I'm so glad to see all the changes that have happened in the gardens over the years. The Slovenian Cultural Garden is the next one to the north. Um, it was originally named the Yugoslav Garden, but then renamed Slovenian Garden. It is closest to St. Clair Boulevard, uh, where that first of the um, bridges of John D. Rockefeller is located. Um, this actual garden is dedicated to the culture of Slovenians, Croatians, and Serbs uh, when it was originally opened. A circular fountain and pool are the central features of a paved courtyard. Two very stately linden trees, typical of Slovenian lipa, whose sweet scented delicate blossoms are used to brew tea, tower on each side of the entrance. To the left of the entrance is a purposefully sunken formal garden and to the right a semicircular section that extends to a wide stairway that takes you from the upper level to this pasture where again, 
thousands of people can come mostly for poetry readings that they would have there. The uh, stage-like courtyard here provides a natural amphitheater and the massive shade trees all around um, and the peaceful babbling of Doan Brook provide an ideal setting for um, this garden when in 1949 it was dedicated with over 2,000 plants and flowering shrubs. This garden is a definitely a concrete testimony to the idealism of this very brave people. The very northernmost end of the original cultural gardens. Now, mind you, I am aware of all of the newer gardens to the north. Vietnam, Azerbaijan, Serbia, you name it. There are many more to the north now. But the original historic cultural gardens to the north ended with the Polish garden. And that was purposeful because Poland felt that where it was placed in Europe, they were the protector of European culture from any Asiatic aggressors, as they called it. And this Polish garden was dedicated in 1934 with the setting of an elm tree from Poland. Five busts, as you see in this circle here, of Polish men who made an impact on history were also dedicated. Um, unfortunately, all were destroyed during the 60s in the troublesome time, but happily, all of them have been replaced as well by now. Um, Copernicus is one of them that uh, was remade, a replica in granite made from the original mold that it would have been bronze. Granite walls containing colorful garden beds are all around this with privet hedges and evergreens um, encircling a hexagonal sunken garden. Many of the trees and shrubs were imported from Poland, including a tree from Chopin's estate. Uh, the octagonal, octagonal fountain was the central feature. Chopin, as you see here, is predominantly um, honored in this garden as being thoroughly Polish and yet very international. And this is why he represents the perfect ambassador for the rest of the countries of the world. Actually, that was, I'm sorry, Copernicus in the last one. And that was, um, oh goodness, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> We're all learning with these new formats of sharing. Let me take you here, Copernicus, Goodness, I know him anywhere from his hairstyle. Chopin with that high collar. He has his own little corner of the garden. Died in 1849. And I love this one to Madame Curie. She was married to a Frenchman. However, she was of Polish descent. She was Polish, French physicist and chemist a woman honored by the world for her services to mankind, as you see here, and her discovery of radium. The list on her bust goes on and on as to what she discovered. She was such a scientific genius, but I love the fact that as the list goes on for her scientific genius, the very bottom line is, and she was a good mother. <laughs> <laughs> kind of sweet. <laughs> it's like, well, she was all that, but on top of it all, she was a good mother. And that is very special. Um, <clears throat> in an address given in the Polish Garden by Judge Sawicki in 1953, he said that the Cleveland Cultural Gardens, together with the Polish Garden, are symbolic of hope that the day may dawn when jealousy, suspicion, hatred, and strife may forever cease and be supplanted with universal peace and friendship among all the people of the world. And of course, St. John Paul II, one of our popes, also of Polish descent, was, is recognized here as well. When you get to the very northern part of the cultural gardens of Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, 
you will find that we do have the Rockefeller Park greenhouse there. Now this greenhouse has been there since the 1920s and is really something wonderful to tour. I can hardly wait till it can open again because it's one of my happy places to go. <laughs> if I ever feel the world closing in on me and I wanna to go to some place that really lifts my spirits, it's these, this greenhouse. It's free, it's open virtually every day of the year. Unfortunately, it has been closed because of the pandemic, but I'm hopeful that one day again, it will open for us all to enjoy. Recently, the Japanese garden inside of the Rockefeller Park greenhouse property had been totally renova renovated by a Japanese horticulturalist. It is beautiful. If you had been there in recent years, it had gotten kind of shaggy and I'm sorry for that. However, now it has been brought to its original glory and each one of these trees, shrubs, flowers, they represent such a part of Japanese history. It is phenomenal and it is beautiful how it has been brought back. Some of these trees are just ancient and they were brought from Japan to be planted here. All of the gardens are, have such a big group of volunteers, so proud of each ethnic heritage. One World Day is a very special event that's held every year. Well, again, with the COVID, it would be postponed. I'll presume it might be again this coming fall, but I don't know. I'd like to think that maybe it could happen once again, where people in native costume were there carrying the flags of their country proudly, they serve uh, food native to their land. People are dancing. It's just a very fun time. You will see on the website of um, culturalgardens.org, you must go to that website for more information. Of course, the book, Their Paths Are Peace, but also Dr. Dr. Mark Tabot from the Department of History of Cleveland State University is one man who has worked so diligently to record all of the history of the gardens. Yes, the volunteers are out there getting their hands dirty, planting the flowers and keeping the gardens looking good. But Dr. Tabot has really done more research than anybody I know um, in recent times to preserve the history in a fabulous website. And you must take note of this website and go and, as they say, read more about it because certainly there is so much to know. The Western Reserve Historical Society just posted a handful of days ago, November 2nd, a wonderful essay about the symbolism of the cultural gardens and what they mean to all of us. Well, it's obvious that when you walk through these gardens that men might bicker about politics but cultural pride shows no boundaries. We have no eye for race or creed or culture when we walk through these gardens. All we know is the sense of peace and tranquility that comes with all of the gifts that people have given us with their culture. So if anybody has any questions at this time, I'd be more than glad to answer them. But I hope you have enjoyed this and I do encourage you anytime you can to take a walk through the gardens because they're really worth walking through and enjoying. Couldn't do them all in one day. Gotta space them out, they're so big. And the Chinese garden, why is it at such a distance away? Truthfully, I don't know, but that was their choice of where to be placed. They are very far to the south and you know that beautiful white marble decorative um, fountain and statuary were all a gift to Cleveland from China. Um, it, that was not one where we had to raise our own money. Are there narrated tours? Yes. Now again, I've heard there were Lolly the, Tower, Lolly the Trolley tours, but I also understood the bus didn't stop. I'm thinking, how can you do that without stopping the bus? But yeah, there are tours. 
farewell tour. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I've enjoyed this, but you know, I've been giving talks on Cleveland's history, believe it or not, for over 40 years. <laughs> I know I don't look a day over 40. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> but um, I've been doing a lot and now, I'm, you know, because we're not permitted to all gather together. Oh, it's such a shame, although I do like doing this and this is very different. Um, there are symbols on some of the bridges. Do we know what those are? Almost looks Pennsylvania Dutch. You are right. I've thought the same thought and I don't know. But you know, when I have a question who I ask, Dr. Mark Tabot, <laughs> I'll send him an email and ask him, what's with this? Sometimes we can figure it out. Um, knowing Charles Schweinfurth, who was an historical architect, designed those bridges, why would he put Pennsylvania Dutch symbols on it? He was German. I wonder if his family settled in that area, Pennsylvania Dutch, where many of the Germans did. Leonard Schlother, when he first came to our country and started that brewery, he settled in Pennsylvania. Maybe Charles Schweinfurth was equally influenced by the Pennsylvania culture that way. I don't know. I'm just making all that up, but it sounds plausible. <laughs> but I'd ask Dr. Tabo to get a real straight answer. <clears throat> Who mows the lawn? Good question. You know what? The city mows the lawn. And I understand that John D. Rockefeller gave money in perpetuity so that a group of people hired who knew what they were doing would mow the common areas of lawn. The plantings of all the flowers, the trees, the busts, the fountains, all of that is taken care of by the volunteers of the different ethnic groups. Um, is it safe to visit during the day? Yes, I walk there all by myself during the day. I feel wonderfully safe. I do credit Mayor uh, White with having added more lights, um, nice pathways. You'll see college students going down through the paths. You'll see mothers pushing baby carriages. Um, you really do feel safe. And if you park up on Upper East Boulevard, frequently there are police cars parked there just to keep an eye on the neighborhood. And it's always good to give them a little wave and say, that's me and I'm gonna be walking around by myself. But um, I do feel very safe. Do the gardens have an official closing time? Um, secure in the evening, any patrols? They do not have a closing time. No, they are. That is the main thoroughfare from I-92 um, University Circle and the hospitals and the college and all that. So it never closes. Could you walk around the gardens at night? Sure. Um, should you? I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but during the day, I feel fine about it. Are there patrols? Yes. Are they there very regularly? Yeah, kind of. But still, I don't think I'd go there during the evening uh, by myself. Um, the big trees are cared for by the city of Cleveland. <clears throat> yes, they are. Um, Somebody says, I've lived here for 35 years. I've traveled MLK or Liberty so many times and finally took this summer to visit the gardens. Good. My husband and I spent three hours. Absolutely amazing. We didn't realize we needed to walk up to East Boulevard until a volunteer told us to go up there and see the rest. Can't wait to go back. We are so lucky. Yes, we are. And you know what? This is the only string of gardens in the world dedicated to peace. I think that's something to be very proud of because, um, oh, just in today's climate and all that, it's really nice to know that all these diverse cultures pulled together, especially during the Great Depression and made this happen. And heck, if our ancestors could do that, then just think of how we can pull together today and make the world a better place. <laughs> Another native Clevelander. Oh, well, thank you. I, I can't take credit. I just share what um, I have learned from others like Clara Letterer in her book. And um, 
Dr. Thibault with the website. Um, I like to compile information from my career as a librarian and um, share it so that we all can know a little bit more. How old are the oldest trees there? That is a very good question. Many of them might very well have been planted by John D. Rockefeller, Jeff DeWade, and um, William Gordon, at least 200 years old. I, I can't say. I did read an interesting equation that you could find online. How do you date a tree? Not like go out on a date, but <laughs> how do you find out how old it is? <laughs> and that is you measure the circumference and whatever that figure is, there's a mathematical equation. You put it in for each type of tree, if it's a maple, an oak, and so on. And you can then date the tree without having to cut it down and count the rings. That would be a terrible way to guess the age. <laughs> if you, if you so saw. cute. <laughs> Rebecca, I just love you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I just can't thank you enough for joining us tonight. And I do hope you walk through the gardens as soon as you're able to enjoy them. You'll have to go several trips because there's so many acres. Thank you.